like my wife does, with her eyes closed, covered up over her head. And and huh? You wish? Oh. What? I'm not saying anything else, Daniel. But I'm glad you're here. Um, you know, I know as I said last week and probably the week before that, Sunday nights are you know, sometimes we have fifteen, twenty, sometimes we have six or seven. <laughs> Eight or nine or ten. Whatever. Oh, there's a black cat in the parking lot, so nobody that like he's not allowed to come in. So but uh so we got one more. He's just outside. But uh, I'm excited tonight. Um, we got a, a great young man with us, and uh, um, he's on local church right here at Center Point. Uh, met over there at Final Approach. God, how long ago was that? Years ago. But anyway, been every time I see him, I say, "I'm gonna get you to come preach. Get you to come preach." So. The Lord convicted me and said, next time you see him, tell him. So I saw him, at a, at, of all places, at a restaurant. Like, I go to restaurants. But I said, listen, October's missions month, but we have, in, we have Sunday night service. Pick a day. So he picked a night. So I'm glad you're here. So I want you to stand. We're going to open this, open this up to prayer, and we're going to worship after worship. We're going to hear the word, and I just want you to let God speak to you. Father, we're so thankful, so grateful for your grace, for your mercy. Thankful, Lord, today for your spirit, your presence that filled this place. And, Lord, tonight, as we come back, Lord, we're still hungry. We're still thirsty. We still want, Lord, to more of you. So, Lord, as we enter into our time of worship, meet us here. Fill this place with your presence, with your anointing. Lord, anoint your servant as he brings the word tonight. Lord, your word's already anointed. Let us be anointed to receive it as you would have us to receive it. Now, Father, bless our time together. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
been a while, but hear my heart cry. Just say, oh, 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 Just lift your hands to worship him, to love on him. Lord, we just worship you right now. We say that this be our prayer tonight, that we live to worship you. That we live to worship you. I, I live to worship you. I'm made to worship you. I'm created to worship you. 
So, Father, tonight we just exalt you in this place. We lift you high in this place. As we say, we have come to worship you. We have come to worship you. And we're thankful, Lord, for your spirit that has filled this place, for your presence that has flowed through this place tonight. And we just worship you in spirit and truth. And we give you all praise. We give you all glory. And we give you all honor in this house tonight. Would you give the Lord praise in this place? Worship is not something that we do, it's something that we are. It's a lifestyle that we live, and it doesn't always require music. Hello? It don't always require music. You may be seated if you can. Wow, what a great time of worship. Spirit of the Lord's here. I am excited tonight. We have Brother David James with us. Uh, some of you probably know some of their family and his late grandfather recently, Brother Lewis James, went home to be with the Lord. Um, when was it? A few weeks ago. Um, but uh, not, not trying to stir up bad thoughts or memories, but, you know, uh, I know where he's at tonight. <laughs> I know he's worshiping, really. He's really worshiping tonight. So I want you to give a great new life welcome to our brother, David James. I'm nobody tonight, but I came to tell you about somebody, and he's worth more than that little clap I just got. Can we give Jesus a hand clap tonight? God, we worship you tonight. Has he been good to anybody tonight? Has he seen you through tough days and dark nights? Has he been with you? Has he walked with you? Praise God. He's walked with me. He has walked with me. Uh, you're catching me kind of at an odd time in my life. I'm wrapping my 20s up. This is my last month in my 20s. I'm closing it up, and I'm about to turn 30. <laughs> so you get you get me at the end of a chapter. And I think there's something to be said about the end of a chapter. Amen? I brought my towel with me because I haven't decided if I'm going to tell it or yell it yet. All right? <laughs> so if I decide I want to yell it, I got it with me. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> God is so good. He has been so good in my life. Has he been good to you? Man, he's been, I wake up every day and I've decided that I wake up and I say, God is good. Whether it looks like it or not, whether I see him or not, whether it looks like he's present in my life or not, I've decided that God is good. Amen. A little bit about me. I'm third generation uh, minister. As he said, my late grandfather um, come to find the Lord, I guess probably 60 years ago, um, found Jesus Christ got baptized in the Holy Spirit and went home that night and laid down in the bed and thought, I have lost my mind. <laughs> I have went crazy. And I am so, so grateful that he woke up the next day and decided he hadn't lost his mind and he held on to the faith. Thank God. Uh, thank God. There's something to be said about first generation Christians. Any first generations in here? Anybody? You made your first generation? Anybody? Praise God. We come from good stock then. Amen. There's something to be said about somebody that's willing to change the direction of their family. That is, there is something to be said about it, and I am grateful. Uh, my dad was a minister, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later as we go. Um, and here I am doing whatever I do. I'm not exactly sure what it is, <laughs> uh, but something in the ministry. Amen. I currently uh, I stepped down from my role at Center Point. I was on staff for five years as student pastor. And uh, that's a full, if you've ever did anything with students, you know that consumes all of your time, praise God. Um, and the ministry as a whole consumes all of your time. Um, but students are, 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 today, in today's time, they, they, they grow up, they have no, most of them, uh, even in the church, don't have mom and dad at home. They have mom or dad. And um, most of, uh, probably I would say 15 to 20 percent are raised by grandma and grandpa, even in the church. It's amazing. Um, so it's a, it's a real there's a real need in our day and time for people to reach students. So um, I'm thankful for anybody that helps with children and the students because they need our love and our attention uh, more than anything, more than our money, more than our resources. They need our time and our attention. That's what they need. 
um, so they need our time and our attention. If you have your Bibles with you, you could go with me to Philippians 4, um, verses 4 through 7. I doubt I'm going to preach anything tonight you haven't heard, but I just came to encourage you. I just came to encourage you tonight. I don't believe it's by chance that you and I met here tonight at the same time in the same place. You could have been anywhere else in this world, and I could have been anywhere else in this world. And tonight, somehow, I don't believe by chance, but God lined our paths up, and here we meet tonight. Here we meet tonight. Do you believe it? I believe it. I believe it with everything in me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Will anybody rejoice tonight? Rejoice in the Lord always. Thank you, God. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. As I pray for you, would you pray for me tonight? Dear God, I thank you so much, God, for your sheep that are here, God. Would you meet with us tonight, God? Would you speak to us tonight, God? God, would you open, God, my mouth up, God, not to say what I want to say, God, but to say what you would have me to say, God. Would you control my thoughts, God, my emotions, God? Would you lead me and guide me as we walk through this tonight? God, I pray for every ear, God, they would hear not my words, but your words, God, that you would open the eyes and the ears of their hearts, God, to see you tonight like they've never seen you before. God, your word says that when two or more are gathered, you're in the midst, God, so I know for a fact that you're here with us. God, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. What does that tell us? We're going to have requests, <laughs> right? Let your request be known to God. That means we're going to have some. We're going to have some things in life to be anxious about. We're going to have some things in life that are going to trouble us. We're going to have some things in life that are going to be difficult that come our way. If not, if not, the Scripture wouldn't tell us to bring those things to God, right? So having troubles and having difficulties and having hard times doesn't mean that we're not with God. It means we need to take those things to God. Amen? And I love what this says here. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God which surpasses understanding. That means that you and I cannot understand and still have peace. In a world that tells us we have to have all the answers, we've got to have all the pieces to the puzzle, you cannot have all the answers and still have the peace of God. Now, a lot of times you and I get happiness and peace mixed up. Happiness, now, that's just, that's just this flesh getting what it wants. <laughs> that's really what happiness is. We go to Disney World and, ooh, we're happy. <laughs> Some of y'all said, I don't want to go to Disney World for nothing, right? <laughs> Go to Golden Corral. I don't know where you want. Me and Pastor Jeff, we go down to El Toro Loco, and we feel the happiness when we go in there. <laughs> Whatever it is for you, the Georgia Bulldogs yesterday. Come on, somebody. Go dogs. <laughs> We're not talking about tech in here tonight, Pastor. Come on. They did win, though. I give, you, I give you a little pat. They won. I don't know how they did it. They came back. That's happiness, right? We enjoy those things. They're happiness. It's just happiness. It's temporal. It's just here today and gone tomorrow. But his peace, his peace is somewhere down deep inside of you. You've got to have a peace down inside of you that only God can give. That doesn't come from the things of this life. That doesn't come from our situation being good or our situation being bad. That's a gift that God gives us that can remain constant despite our situation or circumstance. Tonight I want to talk for just a few minutes about the idea of peace without answers. Peace without answers. You can have peace and not have all the answers. You can have peace and not have all the answers. Peace that passes understanding. If you're going to have peace tonight, you've got to believe one thing first. That God loves you and he's pleased with you. If you don't believe that God loves you and he's pleased with you, it's going to be hard to have peace. Because you're going to spend all your days thinking, does God love me and have I made him happy or not? That's what you're going to spend. Your whole time is going to be consumed with that. Matthew chapter 3, 
Verse 13, Jesus is starting his ministry, and he goes and he meets with John the Baptist. And he's going to get baptized. And the scripture tells us this, then Jesus from Galilee, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, uh, to John, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. Some versions say the heavens were open. It doesn't matter, either to Jesus or to everybody there. I think it was probably everybody there reading the next part of the text. And the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And listen to this verse here. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That's what God says from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, what did Jesus come to earth to do? Pay, to save us. To pay the price for our sin. That's what he came to do. But at this point in the story, Jesus has not yet fulfilled that work which he came to this earth to do. Yet God the Father says, hey, I want to introduce you to my son. This is my beloved son, Jesus, in whom I am well pleased. I don't know who needs to hear this tonight, but I don't care if you've done yet what your calling is, or if you've moved on it, or if you've stepped out into it or not. I came tonight to tell you that God looks down from heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he sees you, and he says, that is my son, and that is my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. He is pleased with you tonight. He is pleased with you tonight. Don't let, don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let your mama lie to you, your daddy, your son, your friend, your brother. God is pleased with you. Not because of your works, but because of Jesus Christ's work. He is pleased with you. John 10, 18 says, No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. They didn't take Jesus' life. He gave it for you so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. You don't have to spend all your days wondering if you're pleasing God or not. He is pleased with you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through the work that Jesus did on the cross, when you and I accept that finished work, we become the righteousness of Christ, and he is pleased with us. Amen. We could go home right now, Pastor. We could go home right now and eat on that all night. Praise God. We are the righteousness of God because of Christ, because of the work that Jesus did. Peace without answers. Maybe you say tonight, Davis, you don't know what I'm facing. You don't know what I got to deal with this week. You don't know what you don't know what I got coming my way. It's easy for you to stand up there and say you can have peace without answers, but you don't know what I'm looking at. I'm reminded of a story in Genesis chapter 22. Abraham and Isaac. God comes down and he talks to Abraham. And he says, I'm, I'm not going to read your Bible for you. You've got to read your own Bible. You know it's not Pastor Jeff's job to read the Bible for you. Y'all know that. you got your own copy. So I'm giving you the cliff note tonight. Go home and read Genesis, tw Genesis 22, all right? I'm just giving you my version of it. God comes down and he talks to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I need you to go sacrifice your son Isaac. Can you imagine Mm. I don't have kids yet, but I can't even imagine what that must be like. Just the love I have for my students and my family, I cannot imagine what Abraham must have felt in that moment. He said, Abraham, I need you to go sacrifice your son Isaac. So what did Abraham do? He said, yes, sir. He loaded up, said he got a couple young guys with him, some of his helpers, and he got the wood, he got the fire, he got the knife, he got all the, all the materials he needed, and he got his son Isaac. And it said they began their journey, and they went, they went to the land of Moriah where he was going to sacrifice Isaac. And I love what the Scripture says. This is the little stuff in the Scripture. If you don't read it for yourself, you'll miss some of this stuff. I love what the Scripture says in verse 5. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. And he says, We will worship, and then we will come back to you. We. That's plural. He said, we will go. Some versions say, we will go over there and worship, and we shall return. 
we're going to go over there, and then we're going to come back. Now, Abraham knows what God's called him to do, to go and sacrifice his son Isaac. But I just believe somewhere down in Abraham's, down in his inside, somewhere deep down in his heart, down below what he thought he heard from God, and down below all of that, down below his emotions and his mind, down on the inside of his soul, he knew that God would make a way out of no way. I believe it. He told him before he ever went, he said, we're going to go and worship, and we're going to come back. We're going to come back. Y'all wait on us right here. Y'all wait on us. And now the Isaac would have been, he would have known about what was going on. Because the scripture tells us that as they were walking, he said, Daddy, I see now. We got the wood. We got the fire. We got the knife. But I don't see no sacrifice. Where's the sacrifice at? And what did Abraham say? God will provide. God will provide. God will provide. God will provide tonight. I don't know what your situation looks like. I don't know what you're facing tomorrow. But I do know this. God is faithful and just. He is, he, he is, he is faithful to his promises, and he will provide. He will provide. I can just imagine as they were getting ready to go up that mountain, and they were going up the side they were on, I can imagine, what about the ram? Where does the ram come from, you know? I can just imagine the ram. God's like, all right, ram, you know what time it is, boy. you got to get up there. you got to meet them on top of that mountain. And so Abraham and Isaac's going trekking up that mountain. they got that wood, and they got the fire, and they got the knife. They're getting ready to do their thing. And I can just imagine that ram's coming up the other side of the mountain. And he's like, I'm going to get up there, and I'm going to get out of there. So he gets up there, and the ram gets up there, and he's looking around. And all of a sudden, I think the ram looked up to heaven and said, God, now I fulfilled my part. I came up on top of this mountain, and I'm out of here. I'm gone. They're not here. And by that time, God reached down. It says he got caught in the thicket. Is that what the scripture says? It says there was a ram caught in the thicket. And I think that God just reached down and grabbed that ram by the horns and tangled that thicket up around him and said, Hold on, boy. You ain't going nowhere yet. There's still a little bit of work to be done. I don't know if that's scripture or not, but it's close enough. <laughs> it just says he was in the thicket, right? And Abraham and Isaac got up, and we know the story. He laid Isaac down and was going to get ready to sacrifice him. When the angel spoke and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, Abraham, Abraham, don't lay a, don't lay a finger on that boy. God has saw your heart, and he's provided a sacrifice for you. And he looked up, and he saw that ram caught in the thicket. The ram was in the thicket. So I don't know what you're facing, but I do know this. If you'll just obey God, if you'll just obey what he's told you today, tomorrow will worry about itself. Amen. 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 What if you say tonight, Davis, I'm not looking to a storm. I'm sitting in the middle of a storm. Anybody ever been in the middle of a storm before? <laughs> I found myself in the middle of them. Some of them I found myself there, and some of them I put myself there. <laughs> Amen. I've, I've created my own storms before. I'm reminded of a story about a storm in Matthew chapter 8. Uh, Jesus and his disciples uh, go out into a boat. And the scripture tells us, it says they got into the boat, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. His disciples followed him. Behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. What does swamp mean? That boat was sinking. <laughs> that boat was, it was filling up with water. The water was coming in on the boat. But Jesus was asleep. The boat was, the boat was being overtaken by water. And Je this sounds to me like, you know, I've never audibly heard the voice of the Lord. If you have, congratulations. Amen. I have not yet audibly heard the voice of the Lord, but I've heard him speak to me louder than that. Right? I have heard him speak to me louder than that. Just never heard the audible voice. But they, they're watching Jesus, and I feel like sometimes he acts like this in my life. This is kind of how he responds, you know. I know God's present, but it's like, God, where you at? Are you, you sure you're with me, God? And, like, I don't know if he's there or not, but I don't think he sleeps, right? Not now. He's with God the Father. He does it, the, the God the Lord. Beep, beep, beep. Back up a little bit. <laughs> God the Father doesn't sleep or slumber, right? That's what the Scripture says. But when Jesus was in his flesh, he needed rest like you and I do, right? So he doesn't sleep now. He needed sleep then. Uh, but God was still there present with him, right? Amen. Don't get lost in the weeds right there. 
But, but I believe sometimes I feel like that. I'm in the midst of the storm, and I'm looking around at the storm, and I'm like, Jesus, where you at? You ever felt like that? Jesus, where you at? Jesus, where are you at? And it says he was sleeping. And they went and woke him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O ye of little faith? Then they rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Obey him. Do you think we ever miss Jesus being in our boat because we're too busy looking at the storm? And we look right past him. He's down here asleep in our boat. He's right here with us. And we look over him. I think that's what the disciples did that day. The storm was around them, and all they could see was the storm. And it seemed as though the storm was overtaking them. But Jesus was in the boat, and they missed him. They missed him. They missed Jesus right there in the boat. They missed Jesus in the boat. Maybe tonight the devil's trying to tell you whatever you're facing is going to kill you. Maybe tonight the devil's trying, he's just lying to you. He's in your thoughts, and he's telling you whatever you're facing is going to take you out. This is going to be it. This is going to be it. You know what I want you to do? Tell the devil, it already got me. <laughs> it's already killed me. It's already taken me out. Davis, what are you talking about? Go with me to Romans chapter 6, verse 13. And verse 3, I mean. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So more than just the life, when you, were bab you and I were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were not only baptized into his resurrection, we were baptized into his death. So whatever, the, whatever Satan's telling you is going to kill you, it, tell him it already got me when I went to the cross with Jesus. It already got me. I've already been baptized into his death. We were buried, and therefore him, therefore with him, by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in the resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that, the body of sin, that, the, that this body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For no one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we... And now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Never die again. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Tell Satan he can't get me again. It's all, God, it, God, he already handled it. He's handled that. Satan, you're lying to me. Because the scripture says that God died for my problems, my sins, my shortcomings, my failures, my weaknesses. Jesus has already died for it, so it can't get me again. Once and for all. Do you believe that Jesus died once and for all? I believe it. Once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So that you must consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You and I are alive today because of what Jesus did on the cross. He took our sins and he died with them. He died with our shortcomings and our failures and we went with him and we were baptized into his life and we went down with him and we came up with him and Paul goes on to say that you and I are, are raised with him to heavenly places and we sit with him with the right hand of the Father. That's what your book says. Read the good book. That's what the Bible says. That you and I are raised with him to heavenly places. Don't let the devil tell you he's going to take you out. He can't take you out. He can tell you he can take you out. He can't actually take you out. Now, you're a child of God. He's got a hedge around you. Amen. Amen. God is so good. The devil, he knows, you know, the devil tells no truth. All lies. No truth. All lies. Everything he says is a lie. Everything he says is a lie. Everything he says is a lie. None of it's true. It's, it's all lies. Over and over and over and over. The devil, he uses the same old playbook. He, he runs the same plays on us. 
And somehow we still fall for them sometimes, don't we? He still gets us down, kicks us down. But we got to remember that we are alive through what Jesus did. What if you say tonight, Davis, all that's great and all that's wonderful, but it's too late for me. Whatever I'm praying for, it's already over. It's already done. I don't, I mean, all that's great and that's wonderful, the storm, and I hear you, all that, but I, it's too late for me. What if you say that tonight? I'm reminded of a story. There's a story I've read about Horatio Spafford. He had several traumatic events happen in his life. And uh, the first being the great fires, the great Chicago fire of 1871. He had a lot of real estate. And when the fire came through, it burned, it burned all his property up. And he was fighting with some legal issues. And um, he was fighting with some issues about zoning and stuff. And he was wanting to go over to Europe to be with the great evangelist um, D.L. Moody. You heard of D.L. Moody, a great evangelist? He was going to go over with his family, his wife and his daughters. Uh, they were going over to be with D.L. Moody and some evangelistic campaigns he had going on. And in a late change of plans, Horatio wasn't able to make the ship to go over. And he stayed behind and he sent his wife and his daughters. And he said, as soon as I'm done with this work, I'll join y'all and I'll meet y'all there. So he sent the family ahead and while he was delayed, his family was on the ship crossing over and there was an accident. And the ship crashed into another ship. And there, his daughters drowned. And there's a famous telegraph that came from his wife back that said, saved alone. Saved alone. Shortly afterwards, Horatio found out about this. He got on a boat and he journeyed over to meet his wife so that he could be with her in the loss of their daughter. And as he was crossing over the Atlantic, when they got over the spot where the, the sinking had happened, the captain alerted him and said, this is, this is the best we can tell. This is where the ship sank. And there in that place, he wrote a song that you and I are familiar with. And he said, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. Can anybody tonight say, it is well with my soul? God, it is, God, maybe it didn't turn out like I thought it should have. God, maybe it didn't, the prayer didn't get answered like I prayed it. But God, nonetheless, tonight, it is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. Peace without answers. Peace without answers. I stand before you tonight. I was joking when I started talking about season changes, and I feel like I'm getting older. I am getting older, about to be 30. I know that's some of you, for some, that's young. For me, it feels old. I don't know. 30, I feel like at 30, you should, like, have your stuff going, you know? Like, you need your, all your stuff in order. Like, you're like an adult at 30. You're not like a young, you're not a young guy anymore. You're like, you're stepping into it. Um, but life has, life has thrown some curveballs. Anybody had any curveballs thrown there in life? Any curveballs come? A little bit about myself. I told you I'm third generation. I'm um, growing up, I grew up in a normal family, normal home. I actually a PK. My dad was a pastor. And um, pastored in a little city called Jefferson, Georgia. It's not that small anymore. It's actually growing, uh, really developing on the north side of town. But it was really small when uh, him and my mom went. My mom's here tonight. Uh, thanks to her for coming tonight. But uh, my mom and dad, we grew up just a normal family. I have a sister, just your normal um, brother, sister, mom, and dad. Just, I mean, the American, the American family, right? Two kids, mom and dad, just normal. We were just what I call average, I consider average, just normal, you know, and um, mom and dad, they had had great jobs, and they gave them up and went into the ministry, you ever wonder why you did that, <laughs> give them up and went into the ministry, um, sometimes we wonder what it's all worth, what's it, what's it all worth, you know, and they went into the ministry, uh, just trying to, trying to do what they thought they were supposed to do, and uh, they took a church, uh, just a few people, 20 or 30 people, and had really grown it over 14 years. And they were running several hundred people. And uh, one day in a moment of weakness, this 
spiritual attack? My dad took his own life. The pastor. The pastor. You know your pastor struggles sometimes. You know your pastor has hard days. You know your pastor carries a weight that you don't know unless you've been a pastor. He feels a burden that you can't feel unless you've walked in those shoes. My dad, I was there that day. I was 10 years old in the home. I was in the house with him. Me and my mom were there. My sister was gone. Life changed that day. Life changed. As a 10-year-old boy, life took a different path. We were living in Jefferson. And that day, I never stayed in Jefferson again. We moved to Griffin. Same day. I lost my, lost my dad. I lost my church. I lost my school. I lost my friends. The city I grew up in. The house I had lived in my whole life. In one instant, my life changed. I remember that day. I remember that day. For the first time, I experienced a peace that I can't explain. I don't know what it was, but I know I felt something inside of me that said, you're going to be all right, boy, just hold on. You ever felt that before? I felt something down inside of me that just said, you're going to make it. You just got to hold on. So life progresses. Life goes on. And as I get older, people are telling me that I'm going to be a pastor. Well, you know what pastor's kids say. No way. You're crazy. I would never be a pastor. I've seen how people treated my granddad. I've seen how people treated my dad. I'm, I'm out on that. <laughs> I don't know if you know or not, but sheep are mean. <laughs> they bite. <laughs> they smell bad. <laughs> no, I'm just sheep are rough. Sheep are sheep, right? People are people. They don't mean anything by it. They're just people. I was like, I'm not going to be a pastor. No way. So I said, God, everywhere I would go, people would be like, when are you going to start pastoring? When are you going to be preaching? When are you going to start pastoring? I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> so I just told God, I said, God, if you're going to use me, you're going to have to tell me. Not somebody I know, not through somebody I know. You're going to have to confirm it somehow. So I gave it to God, and I let it be. And uh, I was doing my thing. God, you know, if you ask him to speak, he will. <laughs> if you ask him to confirm something, he will. He will do it. I know it. I said, God, I said, if you're gonna if you're gonna use me, <laughs> you're gonna have to talk to me. And not just by some like this could be or could not be. Like I need it like black and white. Anybody need the black and white? I'm a black and white kind of guy. I need it like not a kinda, not a maybe. I need to know, God, this is I've heard from you. So I said, God giving it to you. When you're ready, let me know. Anybody ever been to the Perry Fair? Perry Fair in, in Perry, Georgia. Sit down, I can't even drink anymore. Y'all, I'm getting old. <laughs> I was at the Perry Fair. I was maybe 18, 17. We were getting on a ride. And guy running the ride, he got up out of his seat, came over, standing by the fence. He said, Pastor, you know how you do that? You know how you do the quick turn, like who's behind me? I was like, hmm. look back, there wasn't nobody. So I just went back doing my thing, you know. I was with my friend. And he said, Pastor. I looked back again thinking maybe I missed them, you know, maybe they were back there and I didn't. I, I looked back. He said, Pastor, you. I said, what? I said, I'm not no pastor, brother. I don't know who you're talking to. You think I'm playing? I really told him. I said, I don't know who you're talking to. I'm not a pastor. And he said, he said, man, I don't know what, I don't know. He said, all I know is this. He said, years ago, I felt like God told me to tell somebody something. I never told them. And I live with it every single day. Now, I'm not claiming that I'm living right. I'm not claiming I got it all together. I just know I was sitting over there at that booth running this ride, and I heard God tell me to come tell you that you're a pastor. I said, what? He said, I said, I'm not a pastor. You're not hearing me. So we're having this discussion, and he said, well, if you're not a pastor, then you're going to be a pastor. I said, whatever you say, man, whatever you say, you know, and just dismissed him. But that day in my heart, I knew God had spoken to me, and that was what I needed. 
That was he could not have known me. I never seen him before or since. I I don't know who he could have been an angel for all I know. I don't know I, I don't know his name. Don't know where he's from. No nothing about the man, except that day he answered my prayer. He answered my prayer. God can use anybody. God can if he can use a carnival worker, he can use anybody. And I say that with grace and mercy because my great granddaddy was a carnival worker, and if he can use him. He can use anybody, right? He can use anybody. Peace without answers. Sometimes in the midst of our mess, we might get an answer or two. And that day I got an answer. Uh, life goes on. Uh, growing up without a dad, you're always known as the child without a dad, right? That's the boy that doesn't have a dad. You know, you, people think the kids can't hear. They hear. When you talk about them, they know you're talking about them. When you say stuff about them, they hear what you're saying. They say, that's the boy that's not in here. You hear him when you come in. You hear him. And you become, define yourself as the boy without a dad. That's the boy that's not here. That's him right there. And so everywhere you go, you hear that. So I, I had defined myself as that. Graduation comes. Graduation was extremely difficult for me. Um, you're growing up. You're 18. You're getting ready. School's over. And all of a sudden, you're not a kid anymore. And so I'm struggling with the fact that I'm not that boy anymore that I've been defined as, the boy without a dad. Because guess what? As an adult, everybody's dad dies, right? Everybody's dad dies. Everybody's mom dies at some point. If we're lucky enough to live a, lo to live a full life, right, they're going to go before us. So I find myself in this place where I have a real struggle with God just of who I am and what my identity is and what I'm going to do and who I'm going to be. And I really, at 18, grieve the loss of my dad. Grieve the loss of a loss that happened, what, eight years prior to that. I was now old enough to really process and to grieve what had happened. So I did that at 18. And over here at Center Point Church, um, one, one Monday night, Pastor Tracy Stone was having Monday night prayer meetings. And one Monday night, laying in the floor, I said, God, I can't live like this anymore. I can't live with this weight on me anymore. I can't live with this pressure. I can't live like this anymore. And that night in that prayer meeting, laying in that floor over there, God set me free from those feelings. Who knows, he's still in the, he's still in the miracle working business. He's still in the business of freedom. He's still in the saving business. And I am grateful for it. Life goes on, and uh, everything seems to be going on the up and up. Have you ever felt like you've been through your uh, experience in life and you got the box checked? You know, it's like everybody has like an experience, a moment, a difficulty. It's like, well, thank God. I've been through mine. I went through mine at 10, checked the box. Praise God, I'm done with that. Life can be good now. Um, that's where I was at. Uh, until a few years ago, uh, I met this uh, girl. Actually, we grew up together. Um, I met her when she was 16, and I was maybe 18, so about the same time. Uh, I was in youth still. We were youth in church together, and life was good. We had tried to date each other for a couple of years, and when she wanted to, I didn't want to, and when I wanted to, she wouldn't give me the time of day. <laughs> I would beg her to give me a chance, and she would tell me I was crazy to get out of her face. <laughs> and I would say, well, you just give me a chance. She was like, well, you just get out of here. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, Rebecca Hush. And uh, we dated for two years. And she was the one. Have you ever met your one? Anybody met their one? Met your one. She was my one. Do you know, I don't, you know when people say they met somebody and they're like, that's the one? I'm not sure about it. I think we choose to be in love. I really do. I think love is a choice. You meet people, and they, they just met somebody, and they're like, the first day they meet them, they're like, they're the one. I mean, maybe, right? I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying there's a needle, not a needle in the haystack. I'm just saying, you know those people. And then all of a sudden, three months later, you ain't going to believe what they did to me, right? You know what I'm talking about? I feel like we see that a lot. But this had been, this had been like years in the making. Uh, we, were, we had did our thing, and... Uh, she was my one. She was my one. And uh, we had been dating for two years, and we were on vacation with my family. 
and coming home from vacation, um, me and her had a car accident, one vehicle. It was me and her. And uh, I'm here today. She's not with us. She's not with us. I walked, I walked away. And she didn't make it. Talk about peace without answers. Talk about a struggle in the midst of a storm. That day, when he had the accident, I got, I got, I got transported to the hospital. And she got transported a different way. And that day, before anybody told me, I knew she wasn't there. And you know how I knew? Because that day, I felt that same peace down on the inside of me. He said, boy, if you'll just hold on to me, everything's going to be all right. And that wasn't a peace that she was gone. It was a peace that God was in control. Bigger than my circumstances. Bigger than my situation. Bigger than my pain. Bigger than my happy days and my sad days. Is that God is in control. And I'd give anything this world has to offer to have that girl back. She was my everything. She was my everything. That was, the, that was the person I wanted to raise my children. You know, that was that person. But that, that chapter of life is over. And here I stand tonight, I wish I could tell you, I got a wife and everything's worked out and everything's there. And it's going to happen. I know it is. I know it's going to happen. And my story's not over yet. But I stand here tonight and tell you that I wake up every day and I say, God is good. You can have peace and not know how the story ends. And if you're here tonight, I believe that God had you come tonight for some reason to hear. And I think if you can pick this up tonight, if you can pick this little bit up I'm going to give you, I think it's going to change your life. God is not a character in your story. You're a character in his story. It's not God in doing something in your life. It's you a part of his story. It's all about Jesus. Everything this life has to give, everything this life has to offer, everything good, it all goes back to Jesus. He is the center of it all. He's the center of it all. And there's no way for me to know tonight what all everybody in this room is facing what you've been through, what you're going through, or what tomorrow's going to bring you away. But Jesus knows. He's aware. And He loves you. And He's fighting for you. And He has the answer to whatever problem you're facing today. You just have to trust Him. You just have to trust Him. You just have to trust Him. Do you do altar calls? How do you do it? What you want to do? Somebody's here tonight and you don't know that Jesus, I will be remiss not to give you the opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus loves you. I'm not talking about I go to church. I'm not talking about Mama knew Jesus. I'm not talking about Daddy knew Jesus. I'm talking about do you know Jesus Christ on a personal level? He loves you and He wants relationship with you. Jesus doesn't need you. He doesn't need anything from you. He wants everything you got. It's not a need. He has no needs. He wants you, and He created you to please Him. Amen? And if you don't know Jesus tonight, the Bible says today's the day of salvation. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. But I believe tonight that somebody's in need of peace. And I'm not talking about the surface kind of peace. I'm talking about a real peace. We got some music we can play. Or we got some music we can play, a little music. Good deal. It don't matter. Whatever you got, just play us a little something low. But I believe God, God, he's aware. He's aware of where we're at tonight. And he's aware of what we need. And I believe that he came to bring his peace tonight. He came to bring his peace. So we just stand up. I don't know. Is anybody, am I speaking to anybody? Anybody found speaking to you tonight? I don't know what you're facing, what you're struggling with. But if you're, if you're saying tonight, I need peace. Thank you.
Tear down these idols and every stronghold. Tear down all judgment, all of my pride. Tear down religion and all my self righteousness. I want an encounter. Freedom, I say yes, God, yes to your heart and all of your healing. Your ways are higher, Lord, I surrender and come to you just as I am and say yes, yes to Jesus. Come to you, open God. I
Thank you, Lord. I uh, I didn't know the young lady we were talking about. I'd met her, seen her, <laughs> but I've seen him walk through this and never. It's on. It was off up there. I've seen him walk through this. I, not, that I, not that we're best friends and hang out on 24 hours a day, but the times I've seen him, he never lost focus on who God is. And I'm not, I'm not building him up. I'm just telling you that I love the topic, peace with no issues. Too many times we just try to figure it out. Maybe I have a saying around here that I don't know if everybody remembers, but trust the process. God's doing something. We got to trust him. Not too bad for a 29-year-old. Great, great word, man. Great word. What a timely word. What a timely word. Um, continue. I just got reports on my phone this afternoon of more attacks in Israel. More. It looks. It actually, we have sent the Pentagon has sent ships. It's getting serious. It's getting serious. And I'm telling you, the Bible strictly tells us if you mess with Israel, it's not a good thing. So, right now, pray for that peace over that nation. It's God's people, God's nation. And he's going to prevail, I promise you. You've been blessed, you've been touched. The words speak to you. No matter where we are, no matter what we're facing. Man. Good job, brother. Great job. Father, we're thankful tonight for your peace. In the most difficult times and storms that we can be in, your peace never fails. We thank you that even when we don't see it, when we don't feel it, when we don't think it, you're right there with us. So, Father, I pray tonight as, you, as this word is, will take deep root into our hearts and that, Lord, it will, it will bring transformation to our process of our thinking about where we are and that your peace, your peace will never fail us. Now, Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the word. Thank you for your spirit, your presence in this place. Thank you for these that you have touched tonight at these altars. Now, go with us as we leave this place. Let us walk in your peace, be in your anointing. And, Lord, rest upon us. And, Lord, as we face tomorrow and the days ahead, Lord, we want to walk with you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would y'all give Davis another hand, please? I just, I just got a feeling I'll probably have him back over here one day. You think so? I think so. Powerful word. You know, you're talking about that. That's the one. 1983. I moved up here from Pensacola, Florida. I moved in with my sister and. My niece was going to Forest Park High School in Clayton County, and they had football tickets to a playoff football game on a Friday night. I had an abscess tooth. I felt miserable. I didn't want to go, but they had bought me a ticket. I went, and the first thing I bought when I got to, when I got to, to Georgia, I went to a place called Turtles Records. You've probably never heard of it. 
and I bought me a 96 Rock t-shirt. I was not serving the Lord. I was not, I was not, I was running from God, but I bought me that, and I, and it was a, actually a sleeveless shirt, so that night it was cool. I put on my jeans. I put on my sweatshirt. I put that shirt over it. We went to the football game, and the, the girl was on the football field. I didn't see her. I wasn't looking for nobody. I wanted to go home. I was miserable. There was a girl on the football field. It was like the manager. She would give out the water and all that stuff. She was standing looking up in the stands for her brother to show up to the game. Her brother was at Columbus going to college. He was coming to the game with a friend of his. She was looking for him, and her, the football coach walked by and said, what are you doing? She said, I'm looking for my brother, but you see that guy in the black shirt? I'm going to marry him. She's sitting in the booth tonight. I said, and, 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 and we met at school, I, and my niece, her and my niece were friends, and I rode to school with my niece. We was at the vocational building, we, and I walked up to my niece and said, hey, you ready? Let's go. And she said, hey, this is my friend, Debbie. I said, hey, Debbie. And she said, hi. And I turned around, and we was walking back. My niece said, you need to, I said, I need to get her phone number. She said, okay, well, go get it. So I got her number. And I turned around, and I'm walking back to the car. And now, listen, I ain't getting married. I ain't going to marry nobody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to date all of them, right? I'm walking back to the car, and I said, man. She goes, what? I said, I don't know. It sounds weird. I said, but I, I don't know. But I really like her. So it does happen. It does happen. But uh, listen, God bless you. Just Thank him for coming again. Love on him and, and, and just, uh, you know, just, just leave here. You're, you're dismissed, and, and we're just excited. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. See you Wednesday. Hey, IHOP, IHOP, Wednesday, 1030.